coming up, commentary about the tragic shooting in Arizona and the persecution of Coptic Christians in Egypt. Also, interviews with Ann Coulter, Pamela Geller, and our panel topic, free speech. Welcome aboard, beginning with my commentary. First, the tragic and deadly shooting in Arizona, where I was visiting when it happened. Thankfully, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords continues her miraculous recovery. We need to continue to lift up family members in prayer. Within hours of this tragedy, rather than focus on the people involved, the blame game began. Sarah Palin was pounced on over her Facebook map posting that depicted targets on Democratic lawmakers who supported Obamacare. Well, Palin's known for her hunting references, see by some as connotations of violence. But it's downright illogical to put blame on her for this tragedy. The alleged shooter is clearly very ill. So Palin responds by going into defense mode and cautions, quote, journalists and pundits should not manufacture a blood libel for this. She is further attacked. For the record, the term blood libel has become a phrase used by every political stripe to denote extreme defamation. Could Palin have done a better job? Well, that's another issue. The biggest one, politicizing this tragedy. It detracts from the lives permanently affected and the condition of mental illness. Agenda-driven ideologues pushing political causes on the backs of tragedies only serve as vultures who worsen the heartache and disgrace their country. Even in Canada, we pointed fingers about the American gun culture. Come on, we've had our fair share. Look them up. Dawson College shootings, the Lapine massacre, and Fabricant in Concordia, where my uncle, a professor, was shot and killed. The Coptic Christian massacre in Egypt. Suicide bomber steps out of a car, detonates himself, and kills at least 21 Coptic Christians, wounding 100 more. They were celebrating Christmas Mass. Egyptian President Mubarak expressed condolences, but the West needs to watch very closely. Cops number about 15% of Egypt's population. Under Mubarak's rule, violent attacks against them intensified and runs rampant. In addition, security forces routinely clash with cops when they protest their persecution. Question, does the Egyptian government have an agenda? Consider this. The climate of hatred against the cops is deeply entrenched in Egypt's institutions. Killers of cops are rarely apprehended. If so, then given a slap on the wrist. But Beric seems to be appeasing Islamists, who are, by the way, on a Christian cleansing drive, seen not only in Egypt, but in the West Bank and Lebanon as well. But Beric's likely goal to strengthen his hold on power and pass it on to his son, particularly given his own ailing health, his age, and that he's out of sorts with his own military. While Mubarak may have big trouble on his hands given the uprising in Tunisia that resulted in the ousting of President Ben Ali. Dozens of Egyptian activists opposed to President Mubarak's three-decade regime danced outside the Tunisian embassy in Cairo chanting, Ben Ali, tell Mubarak a plane is waiting for him to, unquote. An infuriating thought. Egypt has received over $30 billion of American foreign aid since the signing of the Camp David Peace Treaty, yet continues abusing the human rights of Coptic Christians in violation of a prerequisite for receiving American foreign aid. But who's watching? We focus criticism on Israel as a habit. Yet to those Muslims that support the Christian Copts, a group of Muslims offered themselves as human shields to protect Copts at a church following the bombing. The issue of free speech. We'll be addressing this topic with a live panel later on, followed by an interview I did with Ann Coulter. We'll talk about it after this message. Stay tuned. Welcome back to On the Front Line. I caught up with Ann Coulter at the David Horowitz Restoration Weekend in Palm Beach. Ann has a reputation of saying things unwatered down. It's her style and has garnered her plenty of attention, including the threat of physical attacks, enough to need a bodyguard. She talked about her visit to Canada, people's reaction to her overall, and some of her issues with left-wing ideology. Take a look. I can't wait to come back to Canada. <laughs> Are you going to be speaking in Carleton? <laughs> well, um, I may be speaking before the Human Rights Commission because I do have a complaint pending there against Francois Ehu. <laughs> <laughs> Has anything come of that? Um, yeah, we're collecting. My lawyer, the great Ezra Levant, has been collecting lots of documents, discovery. Um, so he's 
we're moving along and getting some good stuff, I think. Now, why do they find you so offensive in Canada? Um, I suspect, like American liberals, they haven't actually read anything I've written. <laughs> and in fact, I mean, this is part of the reason I speak uh, at a lot of college campuses. I'm often the only conservative college kids are going to hear in four years of college. And I can't tell you how many kids I've met a year or two out of college, sometimes still in college. Um, one, one came to a radio station I was in last year, KABC in LA, he was my biggest fan. He wanted me to sign books. He happened to know the host. And so, you know, we're chit-chatting and I'm signing books. And he mentioned that the first time he ever heard of me when he was, was when he was standing outside one of my speeches at his college with a bullhorn denouncing <laughs> me. And then he thought after protesting me, huh, maybe I should read one of her books. And he said he read the first one and thought, this makes a lot of sense. And he started reading more of them, and now he has them all, and he's my biggest fan. You said something very politically incorrect, and it had to do with women in voting. Oh, yes, I keep trying to repeal the 19th Amendment. It was a rash experiment with the woman's vote. But it hasn't really taken off, so I've turned my attention to the 26th Amendment which is the amendment that allows 18-year-olds to vote. You can't even drink at 18 anymore. <laughs> the argument for allowing it, it was, a, it was added to the Constitution only yes. in 1971. That's right. And the argument was, oh, they can drink at 18, they can be conscripted to go fight, and it was right at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, well, we don't have a conscrip conscription anymore. There's no draft. Um, and by the way, I'd make an exception for the military. <laughs> and according to the Democrats with this newly passed and soon to be repealed Obamacare, uh, you're not an adult you, to get off your, your parents' health care policy until you're 26. So my motto is not old enough to pay for your own health insurance, not old enough to vote. Now, you call the left a religion. Why is that? Yes. Um, I mean, they have all of the tropes, the attributes of a religion, the intolerance of another point of view, the belief in things on faith. I mean, take gun control. How many times do we have to disprove that? How many studies have to be run for an accounting that allows the law-abiding to own guns suddenly crime rate declines and you know a surrounding county there was the famous Gunnison Georgia that was the first one where it was demonstrated John Lott ran the numbers going over many many decades of many many counties I think it was it may have been could it have been every county in the US but it, it is a huge study how many times do we have to prove this and still liberals as a matter of faith no gun control we must have gun control <laughs> now Obama's campaign on change and on hope you had <laughs> quite a bit to say about that <laughs> yes Yes, that was quite a catchy campaign slogan, wasn't it? <laughs> hope and change, change and hope. Um, every politician runs on change and hope. That was, I went back uh, sometimes for my, for my college speeches, um, I run through all of these quotes about, you know, what, what this campaign is, uh, is about is change. It's about change and hope, and it's just quote after quote after quote from, from campaign spokesmen and from the New York Times describing the campaign of change and hope. And at the end of my list, I say this is all from the Clinton campaign <laughs> because that was the Clinton campaign as well, hope and change and bringing people together. And do you see yourself as a feminist? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Never no. that label? No, 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 no. No, it's like it would be, you know, I like I like I like dogs and flowers, but I'm not a green. That it, greens are um, you know, watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside. That's the feminist movement. No, I'm pro women. Feminists, they're just pro killing their babies apparently. Now, it's interesting that you talk about being pro-woman. But there are those that say, "Anne is cruel. She can't be pro-woman." From your perspective, you take this very uniquely. You see it as a right and a left issue. It is. I mean, look at what the feminist movement has done for, for women in America. Um, they made divorce much easier. Um, they, are the, they were the ones going around defending Bill Clinton, having affair after affair with interns he didn't even know the names of. Um, how, how has that helped women? Has divorce really worked out for American women? No, of course, when a woman gets divorced, her 
her income goes down significantly. She doesn't have a man around. And um, that's why single women are liberal. It, I mean, it really isn't something genetic with us, but it is something genetic to, to, to you know, have the sense that you need a man you can depend on. And when there are no men you can depend on, and when the law don't force the men you marry to allow you to depend on them, well, then the government becomes your husband. In Canada, politics always comes down to abortion. It happened with the G20. It always comes down to that. Is that what they were so testy about? <laughs> That's what they were testy about. Harper did not support abortion in Africa. You know, I'll tell you something interesting. Um, I think it's interesting, as my father would say. I'll be the judge of that. Um, I spoke at my alma mater, Cornell, um, a few years after after graduating, I was debating the head of Planned Parenthood. It was the, head, the beginning of this. It was a whole weekend, a pro-life weekend, and they were bringing in pro-life speakers like me. And um, by the time I got there, it was the end of the weekend. It was the big finale. Um, <laughs> the room, much like will always be the case in Canada, by the way, had to be lined with cops. That's how insane the pro-choice people were, and shouting out the most vulgar expressions um, I think I've ever heard, and I have not even told my best friends what, what they are. I don't think I could write them on a napkin. They were so vulgar. In any event, um, did a lot of question and answer with the audience. And then, I was a smoker then, so as soon as that speech was over, I was right out, standing outside Statler Auditorium, leaning against a post, enjoying a little tobacco pleasure. And as the audience filed out, this long line of girls, you know, lined up to, to argue with me, basically. And I'm telling you, one after another would say, I see your point, I agree with your argument, but what about... And it was always something like, wife beating. So... So why do you have to punish the fetus? That is the thing about abortion. Women, because why would you be so angry about it otherwise? It, it's not that they're angry at the fetus, they're angry at the man who got them pregnant, pregnant and left them hanging. Because it was always about, what, what about the fact that, I understand your argument, but what about the fact that women make 60 cents on the dollar? <laughs> right, it's all their anger at men being directed to this poor innocent baby sleeping in the womb. And that is seen as the feminist movement. When it comes down to women's rights, there's one issue that also stands out. The feminist movement, for example, supports the woman's right to wear a niqab. What's your reaction to that, Anne? Let America remain a country where that does not become a common word. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. But um, I can top that. How about at airport security, they're going to keep checking all the Americans while letting the Muslims go through wearing the, the full hijab or whatever it's called. Now, you're pretty <laughs> offended by airport security today. Oh. It's just, it's so stupid, it's so stupid. As I was saying at the, my speech in the, at the lunch today, I, mean, I have many points against it. One is, as with gun control, they're searching for the thing rather than the person. That's never going to work. They're looking for the sharp objects, and then you get a shoe bomber. Now we're looking for the shoes. Um, then they're looking for the liquids. Now we're looking for pin printer cartridges. So that's one point. You have to look for the terrorists, not the thing. You can't yes. keep weapons out of federal, federal penitentiaries, but I mean, I, I, I suppose the main point is this is a very difficult war. It isn't like a normal war. It isn't like World War I, World War II, where at least, you know, it's a country. There are rules of war. These are terrorists. They come and live amongst us, and then one beautiful sunny day, they fly a commercial airplane into the World Trade Center. The controversial land culture and the issue of free speech. We're going to go for a break now. When we come back, we'll be talking about free speech and introduce you to our panel. Don't go away. Visit us on the web at onthefrontline.tv. Welcome back to On the Front Line. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the issues of free speech, Paul McKeever, a lawyer and leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario, and Hussein Hamdani, also a lawyer and representative of the group North American Spiritual Revival. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. First of all, let's start out with your commentary on what you heard about Ann Coulter, knowing how controversial she is. Well, you know, when she says the left is like a religion, uh, I can really associate. That's absolutely correct. The, the left 
particularly when they engage in censorship against her, you know, right here in Ottawa, they, well, across in, in numerous uh, venues, she faced opposition from students trying to shut her down before she could open her mouth. Now, one can say what they want about whether they agree or disagree with her, but the effort to censor a person is the effort ultimately to attack reason, to attack morality itself. Uh, the left, also known as the multiculturalists, that's who she's ultimately facing, are attempting to replace uh, the belief that people can know and judge with the idea that only government should know and judge. Hussein? Well, I, I agree partly to, to the idea that we can't silence somebody because we disagree with them or find their views offensive, and I, for the record, find her views offensive, especially when she, she's discussing the Muslim community. To me, I see her as an entrepreneur, to be honest. She says bombastic statements from time to time in order to put herself uh, in the public light so that she can sell her books. Even in your interview with her, she mentioned her books maybe a dozen times. I mean, what she's trying to do is try to invite people to, to purchase her, her stuff, and she knows that to, to do that, she needs to say stupid things from time to time that, uh, that will invite controversy and therefore uh, bring her books to, to the public for. Yes, well, go ahead. You know, ridicule, though, sometimes can, can lead to truth. Uh, you know, if someone's proposing something that's false or indefensible, uh, sometimes you will not get to a reason debate before you first start casting the insults. And if she uses, you know, she casts aspersions, if she puts people in an unflattering light, um, that will sometimes, you know, start the real debate. Um, once you break the ice, once you say that, look, I'm not going to hold your beliefs or what have you sacred, I'm going to say everything's on the table, everything will be on the table. Now, I believe that that's personally part of Anne's strategy, and I'm going to direct this next question to you, Hussein. For instance, a situation gained a lot of public attention over some Muslims suspected of terrorism being arrested by the RCMP during Ramadan. It follows after that a meeting was called and apologies were issued to the Muslim community for even doing those arrests on Ramadan. And it didn't stop there. Even having these meetings, uh, the RCMP was so careful as to make sure and observe um, what, what is proper in terms of food and so forth for Ramadan. You transfer this for, to a Christian getting arrested, for example. Imagine the RCMP going out and apologizing to all Christians, visiting churches because they happen to arrest a Christian during a holiday that's holy to Christians. Do you find this a little bit over the top in well, terms of walking on eggshells when well, it comes to the Muslim community? Christina, I would disagree with the characterizations of, of those two examples, but I think, so my, my, my position is if someone commits a crime at any time of the year, uh, the police are perfectly within their right and the society should expect that the police will arrest that person or persons uh, notwithstanding what festivities that they're celebrating. Um, so I, I, so that's, that's how, where I stand. I think vast majority of Canadians take that position. Um, I, uh, you know, the Christians also have another break. You know, I was making this comment earlier. You know, the Jared Lofner, the one who went to Tucson, Arizona, right? He was, until very recently, a church-going attendee. He's a Christian. He identifies himself as a Christian. Yeah, and not one reference is it to his religion, which I think is a good thing. I'm glad that people aren't bringing his religion into his arrest. We joke, though, imagine if he were a Muslim. Same mental illness. This guy was born. His name is Muhammad Ali. He goes there, and he shoots uh, six people dead and injures 12. Are you telling me that his religion would not have come up not once in that discussion about his murderer? So, so there are often where, where people who have faith, some people who have faith, will be held and their faith will be accused and will, be, will stand for trial. But when somebody as well does as something like this and they shout Alu Ho Akbar or something of the sort, no, I'm saying, and they do I'm it in the name did, of their religion, he that, didn't that, do this in the name of his religion. And I'm saying if this, listen, I'm in a fictitious situation, a hypothetical situation, some, some uh, poor, uh, for, for, poor person who, who's got mental illness, but he happens to have the name Muhammad Ali. He didn't do it in the name of religion, but he goes, he's, he goes and he's an uh, Arab, he's got a beard, he shoots uh, six people dead, injures 12. Nothing to do with religion. This is a mental illness that we're talking about. He's a criminal. Um, and uh, I would say, I would posit that his religion, being a Muslim, would have come up in discussion. If he was an African-American, I think his, the fact that he's an African-American would have come up in discussion. Well, and, and, you know, and indeed, uh, that's exactly what the media did do. They over, well, they pre-reacted in, in the case of Lofner. They didn't know anything about him. And some high-ranking left-wing uh, radio announcers immediately su suggested there was a connection between the Tea Party movement and the shooting of a, yes. of a, of a Democrat. Uh, you cannot make, and it's totally irresponsible to make that kind of assumption. It might ultimately 
end up being true. You have to find out in the, in the fullness of time. But you don't in the, you know, in the hours that follow when there's absolutely no idea who this guy is, why he did what he did. Uh, you can't just make these sweeping assertions. I mean, it turns out that, in fact, the, per the, the, the guy reads a wide variety of literature, including everything from Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf, uh, Mein, you know, mein Kampf wow. to, uh, to Das Kapital, the Marx. I mean, you can't say that this guy was somehow a raving Republican. Now, we must go for a break now. When we come back, the question I'm going to be asking our guests, should there be limits slapped on free speech? Stay tuned. Welcome back to On the Front Line. We're going to be asking the question to our panelists shortly. Should there be limits slapped on free speech? Where is that line of pushing hate? Before we do that, let's take a look at this clip where Pamela Geller is featured. Take a look. My position on book burning and censorship is a, it's a bad idea. The antidote to bad speech is more speech, more give and take. The truth will out. So I, I, I didn't particularly care for it, but it, it's protected speech. And the whole idea in America of free press and freedom of speech is to protect all ideas, not just the ones that we like, because who decides what's, what's good and what's forbidden? Um, so uh, I didn't like the idea, but it's protected speech. And again, this idea, the West adopts this idea of the Sharia, do not insult Islam, do not defame Islam, because if there was a guy burning a Bible, nobody cares. They burn flags, nobody cares. Burn a page of a Quran, <gasps> not the Quran. No, uh, excuse me, I don't know who died and made that the Holy Grail. Should there be limits to free speech, Paul? Uh, there are certainly limits to speech we recognize, defamation, and the reason we do things like defamation and fraud is simply for making sure that at no time does anyone obtain their life, your life, your liberty, or your property, you know, take your life, your liberty, or your property, without your consent by way of lying to you. But in terms of religious texts, burning them, and et cetera, she's absolutely right. Uh, you must remain free to do something like burn the Koran, and in fact, again, it's the only way sometimes to open up the debate is to not revere what someone else is uh, holding. The right to be offensive, yeah. Hussein. I would, I would disagree with that. Uh, my, my position is often, though, that the freedom of expression should be universal. So that so we can't have these freedoms are allowed for these people because they have this character characterization, while for these people, they're not allowed to say it because, because of something, uh, their race, their religion, their ethnicity, whatever reason. That type of bigotry is what I'm against, but I agree. I think I agree with her in, in the fact that uh, the a antidote to to lessening or to have these type of debates is to have more expression, more debates, more opportunities to exchange ideas and dialogue, and we all are more robust as a result. Yeah, and you know, and these hate speech codes that are enforced not only in Canada, but in right across the world, and Denmark right now, we're seeing the case of Lars Hedegaard, for example, um, you, you end up with a code that always is enforced in favor of one, but not, or sorry, against one, but not against and all. I have to close on that note. I'd like to thank you both so thank much you. for joining me today. Thank you. And that's all the time you have. See you again next time. I'm Christine Williams, and from all of us, thank you for watching.